As mentioned, the text for this morning's sermon and service is Exodus chapter 4, verses 18 through 31. We've already read it in its entirety, so we won't read it again right now, but we'll be referring to that throughout the course of the sermon, so I invite you to keep your Bibles handy for reference. After the sermon, we will sing in response to the proclamation of the gospel with the singing of Psalm 25, stanzas 4, 5, and 6. Psalm 25, stanzas 4, 5, and 6. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the last time that we saw Moses, and this is especially for the benefit of the Providence congregation who's been a part of this series that we've begun in Exodus, but we'll bring you, the rest of you up to speed here this morning as well. There are a number of guests here this morning. Very glad that you're here with us. The last time that we saw Moses... This is in Exodus chapter 3, in the first half of chapter 4. He was in the middle of this amazing encounter with the Lord God. He had met face to face the great I Am, the Lord God Almighty. He met the Lord God who was revealing his wonderful and comforting intentions for his children, the people of Israel, whom he loved so much. And Moses had been living apart from his people. He had been living apart from the community of, of faith. He had fled from Egypt and was living in Midian. He had fled because his life, 40 years prior, was in great danger. He had defended one of his brothers, his Hebrew brothers, by murdering an Egyptian. And that was found out, and he was afraid for his life. And so he had fled to Midian, and he had started a new life. He had started a family. For 40 years, he had put down roots in this new life away from Egypt, away from his people, away from the Hebrews who were slaves in Egypt. But now, the Lord God himself had shown himself to Moses. He appeared to him in this fantastic way in the burning bush. The Lord had commissioned Moses. He had given him a holy task to do. He had given him instructions in the work that he was to carry out. He said, Moses, you are going to be my instrument. You're going to be my deliverer, the one who is going to lead the Lord's people out of slavery and into their new life with God. And in previous chapters, you would have seen how Moses was resistant to this idea. Moses, like all of the patriarchs who had been before him. Moses was weak and wavering in his faith. We would see how God equipped him for the work that lay ahead. And now here we see Moses about to return to Egypt after 40 years to finally take up the task that he was destined to do. He was destined for by the Lord our God. So our theme for this morning is this, having equipped Moses now, having equipped Moses, the Lord brings him back to Egypt to begin his work. We're going to see three aspects of this. First of all, we'll see Moses' lingering reluctance. We'll see how Moses then prepares Moses for the great difficulty that still lies ahead and then we'll see finally how God begins to show his work among his people. So first of all, Moses' lingering reluctance. While Moses was with God at the burning bush, Moses showed that 
he really wasn't up for the task that God was commissioning him for. You're going to be my deliverer, the Messiah, the Savior of my people. You're going to bring them out of Egypt and, and bring them into their new land. And while the Lord was calling Moses to this work, Moses was throwing out every excuse that he could come up with to avoid the task that, that he had been given to by God. He knew in his heart that this task had been given to him in the opening chapters of, of Exodus. It was revealed that when Moses was born, he was recognized to be a, a fine child. Moses had a sense of his role as the deliverer of his people, and that's what led to his, his murder of the Egyptian who was abusing one of his countrymen. He did this in an act of duty, hoping that he would be recognized for the work that God had prepared for him to do. But when his life was threatened because of that, when it, when it all went wrong, when Pharaoh sought to kill him, he, he had fled. He sort of abandoned that and had second thoughts. Maybe I'm not supposed to do this. And he made a new life in Midian for 40 years. His first attempt at salvation, this murder of the Egyptian overseer that was made according to his own understanding. It was a major failure. And it seems like for the last 40 years, he sort of pushed it from his mind and he's gotten on with his life. And he doesn't really want to consider it again. But in the burning bush, God rebuked him for that. He rebuked him for his lack of faith, but then in a loving and comforting way, he equipped him with absolutely everything that he needed to do the task that God had given him to do. God had given him this supernatural, miraculous ability to do certain signs. Right? He's, he gave him the sign of, of the staff turning into the snake. He told him to put his hand into his cloak and pull it out. And when he pulled it out, it was leprous. And then when he put it back in and retrieved it, it was healed again. Another miracle. And then finally, if there was still doubt, if people were still unwilling to believe, he said, take this water and pour it out on the ground and I will cause it to become blood on the ground. All of these signs that were given in order to show the power and the authority of God. God was sending Moses. God was at work. God is the one who was going to be freeing his people from this existence of oppression and slavery. And Moses' fear lingers. He was afraid, first of all, that yes, the Israelites wouldn't believe him and that Pharaoh would reject him. And God so lovingly provided for that. And as we read in verse 19 of our text, the Lord further assures Moses, he's like, don't be afraid. We read in verse 19, the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So Pharaoh wanted to kill Moses. There were his officers, no doubt, that would be uh, looking for him. All of the ones who had Moses on their list, like they're gone. You don't have anything to worry about, Moses. So now Moses sets out. And we think, okay, we're ready to go. Is everything all set? Everything is good? All of the concerns have been assuaged? God has shown himself to be the deliverer that, of course, we know him to be. Everything is, is ready. Well, we might think so. It appears to be that way, but as Moses is preparing to set off for Egypt, we see that there are still problems with Moses' heart. He's still not quite ready. He's not quite accepted everything. Everything. What sort of problems do we see in Moses' heart here? Well, first of all, at the very beginning, we see that there's something very strange about Moses' conversation that he has with his father-in-law, Jethro. Now think about this for a minute. Moses has just had this 
amazing epiphany. He's seen God. God has revealed himself in this incredible way, this burning bush that wasn't burned. The Lord had revealed himself as holy God. Moses had to take off his sandals. And at that time, the Lord did a number of wonders right before Moses to show him, yes, I am the Lord. You would think, I mean, you would imagine that Moses that day would have returned home from his daily work and had supper with his family and would have said something about this. At the very least, at most, he would have come home and gone into extraordinary detail about the great appearance of God in the burning bush that he had just seen earlier that day. Zipporah, wife, my wife, Jethro, father-in-law, let me tell you what happened today. This is incredible. But he hadn't relayed any of that, it seems. Moses doesn't want to talk about it too much or give details about the commission that God had given to him. What does he tell Jethro? Verse 18, Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law. So he leaves the presence, this incredible presence of the Lord, and goes back to Jethro, goes home, and this is what he says. Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. Now, Moses knows they're still alive. He knows that Aaron is still alive. The Lord told him previously at the burning bush, I have already put Aaron in on his way. He's going to meet you, and I am sending you to deliver your people that you belong to. They are still alive. What's going on with this? He tells Jethro, I want to go back to Egypt just to sort of check, check on my loved ones. What's going on with that? If Moses was fully assured in his heart of all of this that God had revealed to him, if, if Moses was brimming with confidence because of all the wonderful, amazing, and comforting words, promises that God had just spoken to him, wouldn't he just come out with it? and do it with great joy, but no, he's recoiled back from that. He's hiding this for some reason. Maybe he's afraid of how Jethro will respond. Maybe he, maybe he himself only sort of half believes it. He prepares to go to Egypt, but it's quite half-hearted. Is Moses going forward in full conviction, believing with a full heart all of the things that God has revealed to him just now. Moses, like so many who came before him, even though they are called heroes of faith, champions of faith, they are wavering in faith. Moses has spent 40 years away from a life with God, and, and only just now God has really shown himself to him. Just now God has declared in a way that he hadn't before, declared his love and concern for his people, and he has spoken clearly now about his intentions for them. At the burning bush, Moses was able to now see God, know God, know God, who he is through that appearance, but still Moses isn't quite convicted enough. How well did he know God at this point? How much did he really trust God that God would certainly do everything that he said he would do? How much had he seen so far of God's faithfulness and love? How much had Moses seen so far of God's faithfulness and love? You seven here this morning who are about to profess your faith in Jesus Christ, you are prepared to respond 
in a particular way to the way that the Lord has shown himself to you and proven himself to you, made himself known to you so that you trust him and love him. God showed himself to Moses in a way for the first time at the burning bush. And we can see that this is sort of a starting point for him. This is a long road for Moses to be refined in his faith with God, for him to truly know and and trust, yes, God does what he says. God keeps his promises. God is as powerful as we would only hope that he would be. He would be able to overthrow Pharaoh. He would be able to do these signs against Egypt and actually bring about salvation for his people. God hadn't done it yet. He hadn't done it yet. You have been shown, on the other hand, everything about God. Everything. You know in degrees so much greater than Moses. The faithfulness of God. You know in so much greater degrees the faithfulness of God. You know his power over heaven and earth and all creation and every authority that exists anywhere. You know God through Jesus Christ. What do we read in Hebrews? Hebrews chapter 1. The Lord showed himself to his people at various times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has revealed himself to us through his son. The Lord Jesus Christ, whom you know so clearly and so richly, he is the fullest. He is the clearest, most magnificent appearance and revelation of who God is. And you know him. He has shown himself to you. How sure can you be, because of all of that, how sure can you be of his love for you? His power that he works out for your benefit. His ability and willingness to save. How convinced can we all be of this this morning? We know these things. We have seen them in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question now, how do you proceed? How do you proceed? How do you go forward with this knowledge of God that you have been given? This is who God is. This is what God is able to do. This is what God is willing to do for you. How do you go forward? You go forward now in full confidence, do you not? Full confidence because of who you know God to be, who he is for you. There's another little incident in our passage here that that shows Moses' humanity. Humanity. He is a human being, a sinful and faltering human being. This is the strange part having to do with the circumcision of Moses' son, Gershom. Verses 24 through 26. So he's on his way to Egypt. He's, you know, got himself going. He's collected his wife and children, his possessions. He's heading back to Egypt to begin his work. And yet we have this... Incident here, verse 24. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him, met Moses, and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So 
He, that's the Lord, left him alone. He didn't kill him. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. So we learn here that during his time in Midian, when he had gotten a wife and started a family, he had not followed the rules of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. He had not circumcised his son Gershom specifically. Now think about this. Moses is on his way back to Egypt as the chosen one of God to tell the people of Israel, I'm coming to you. This isn't my great big idea, but the Lord God himself, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob sent me to you. This is what the Lord had instructed Moses to say. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob sent me to you. And Moses is going to arrive and show that he has not lived according to the covenant that God had made with Abraham. God had instructed Abraham that this is my covenant with you and with your children and for everyone who comes after you. You are my new family, part of my covenant family, and anyone who is part of my covenant family must bear this sign of your relationship with me, this sign of circumcision. Everyone must bear the sign of the covenant or that person would be cut off. We know from later on in Joshua, Joshua chapter 5, we read there that when they were about to go into the land that all of the ones who had you know, been born in the wilderness, they had to undergo this uh, sacrament of circumcision before going in. Everyone who had come out of Egypt was already circumcised. So the Hebrews who were in Egypt all bore this sign of the covenant. This is something that had been passed down, would be fully known by these descendants of Abraham. How abhorrent would this be to the Hebrews? Really, you're the deliverer, the one carrying out God's fulfillment of the promises to Abraham, and come on, you don't even live according to the most basic rules of that covenant? Why should we listen to you? We don't know particularly why Moses failed to do this. At any rate, we know that he didn't take it seriously. He didn't take it seriously until the Lord appeared to him in, in some way. It says the Lord met him there, whether it was a, he appeared as an angel or a man, we, we don't know. He appeared to him at their encampment, and it says he was about to kill him. In some way, he made it clear to Moses that you are in danger as long as this is not done. There's a whisper of the gospel of Jesus Christ here. The sign of the covenant that points to Jesus Christ. That without the shedding of blood, there is no salvation. And Moses has to be fully confident of this. Moses has to be willing to, in this sacramental way shed the blood of his son in this sign for the sake of the salvation of the people of God. God is a God of, of justice and righteousness. In this he shows that yes, he is indeed a God who punishes sins, who justly and righteously acts toward godlessness and unrighteousness, but at the same time, he is merciful and gracious. Moses' life is spared. When through his wife, he acts in obedience and he continues as the Lord's chosen deliverer. And the Lord prepares him in another way for the difficulties that lie ahead. In verses 21, and, or 21 through 23, the Lord prepares Moses, and this is an, an act of compassion and, and love. 
and we'll see more of this in, in next week's sermon. He prepares Moses to be ready for the opposition that he's going to receive from Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. And he primes Moses for this. He gets him ready to, to anticipate this. I will harden his heart, so, his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. God assures Moses of his absolute commitment to this. This is how much I care for the people that I'm setting you to. They are my firstborn son. This is what God's love for his people is like. And God is going to come down in vengeance upon Pharaoh because of the way that he is treating God's firstborn son. This is a, a revelation of God's justice here. Pharaoh, by enslaving God's children and preventing them from going, he is robbing, in a way, he is robbing God of the relationship that God intends to have with his children that he loves. And God will respond accordingly. You're withholding my firstborn son from me. I will take your firstborn son from you. This is a preview of that awful tenth plague that is inflicted upon the land of Egypt. And the Lord is assuring Moses, like, this isn't a surprise for me. Pharaoh will resist you. Pharaoh's heart will be hard, and he will not let you go. God knows this. This is according to God's plan so that the mighty arm of God will be revealed. But what do we make of that phrase, that God calls his people my firstborn son? The Lord loves his people like a dad loves his firstborn child. What is that love like? That commitment and concern, that dedication to one's child, one's firstborn child, as a new parent, say. I remember my own experience with this. <laughs> Driving home from the hospital with this brand new baby for the first time, brand new dad, you know. Driving down the highway and, and worried about all the crazy maniacs on the road. Why are they going so fast? I have a baby in the car. <laughs> the whole world is different after that, how deep and how full and how comprehensive the father's love for this firstborn child is. Everything is done. Everything in, in a father's power is done out of concern in order to protect this, this little one, this helpless little child. That kind of love and commitment and but so much more, infinitely so much more, because this isn't a, a human father, a, a, a human father with, with limits and with frailties. This is God with his children, whom he loves with a divine love that has no limit. With none of the bumbling incompetence of a brand new parent, this is God's love. God is the father here. How much does he love his firstborn son. He calls his people his firstborn son. And we can get a sense of how great is his love for his firstborn son in what he was willing 
to cause his only begotten son to undergo. He did that for us. He did that for you. He declares his love for his son, Jesus Christ. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God so loved the world, however, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. You have all been given the promise of eternal life and that has been obtained through the sacrifice of the beloved Son of God. That's the Father's love for you, his firstborn son, his firstborn child. He loves his adopted children. That's who we are. He loves his adopted children so much that he has done all of this. So as you're going forward, as you're going forward in your life with God and in the community of God's people, you are able to be assured of the Father's love for you. And all of us who are here, this is a day of rejoicing because we've been able to see with our own eyes the outworking of God's love for his children. You seven here are, are seated in the front of church and you're prepared to stand up and give your answer to the promises that God has extended to you in your baptism. And how has it come to this? It has come to this because of God's great love for you with which he has loved you. You are his adopted firstborn child. At the end of our passage, we have this beautiful record of God's faithfulness. This is a hint of the faithfulness of God that, that Moses will continue to see throughout his ministry to, to his people. God's intentions at this time are to save his people from slavery and to bring him into a life of wonderful communion with him, and he will be working this out. Right? He will be working this out. It depends upon God and God alone. If we think back quite a number of verses ago, what was Moses, do we remember this? What was Moses' first big objection to going back? God says, I'm going to send you back and you're going to save my people. What is Moses' first big objection? What does Moses counter with? This chapter 4, verse 1. What if they don't believe me? Come on, they're not going to believe me. I'm going to go back there and I'm going to say, hey, guess what? I'm here to save all of you. And what are they going to say? Who are you? Get lost, Moses. Aren't you a wanted man? Go to prison where you belong. What if they do not believe me or listen to, or, or and what if they don't listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Get out of here, Moses. God equips Moses. God does all of his work. God equips Moses with powerful signs that God will display through Moses. Through these signs, God will grant, God will grant the gift of faith. God will make it so that they will believe Moses when they see all the things that God does. God is assuring Moses. I will make them believe. That's God's promise. Moses was concerned with the effectiveness of his speech, and God said, who invented mouths and tongues? Who invented talking? I invented it. I'll make it work. God will ensure that the word that the Lord, the word of the Lord that Moses brings will be met with faith among the people of God. This is the work of God and his work alone. And when Moses sees that, he can be assured, yes, God is doing this. End of the passage here. Verses 29 through 30. Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses. This is the word of the Lord. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. What happens? Verse 31, and the people believed. 
Moses did not think that would happen. The people believed. When they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, sort of an ancient way of saying he was concerned with the people of Israel. He had seen their affliction. They bowed their heads and worshiped. What a response of faith that is worked by God himself. What a relief and, and a boost for Moses, isn't it? He was so afraid. They're not going to listen to me. This is useless. I'm just going to stay here. Send someone else. He was so afraid and God assured him, they will listen to you. I'll make sure of it. He sees the faith of the people of God that is worked by God himself. Yes, God is at work. He is faithful. God does wondrous things. God reveals what he's going to do. God's, this is his pattern, right? I'm going to do this. I promise I'm going to do it. Now look, I did it. Trust me. Believe me. Do not doubt me. This is the faithfulness of God. This is a display of his power and his wisdom and his great love for us, his children. This is why it's so important for us to write on our hearts and on our minds the deeds that God has done. Remember them and celebrate them. At our profession of faith interviews, when these seven young members of Providence went and met with the consistory and gave an account of their faith, an account of their intention to live as members of the body of Christ. Each of them spoke about how God had assured them that not only to others, but also to them, not only to others, but also to you, you believe this wholeheartedly. God has granted all of the benefits of the work of Jesus Christ. You know this. The Holy Spirit's work in your heart. You know that the Holy Spirit has made you alive and that he is the one who has done this in you, has made you know him, has caused you to recognize God and to love him. This is his work. I know I belong to God because he made me believe him and know him. What a blessing this is for all of us here. This morning we get to see with our own eyes evidence of the faithfulness of God. God had promised how he would work in the hearts of our children His faithfulness not only to us, but to the ones who come after us. And here they stand up and display proof of the love of God. You who are about to stand and profess your faith in God, you will face many trials of faith, hardships of life. You will suffer it will be hard, but you know the Lord. You know him. You know what he is like. You know his character. You know his love for you. He has shown it in the greatest possible way. You know his steadfastness. You know the great love that he loves you with, that he would save you with a salvation like he has done. You know your God. And all of you here who know your God, you know the Lord, you are equipped. You are equipped because of that to follow him in joy and in, in an unwavering confidence and trust. Amen.